OK, so thank you. I'm going to give an introduction to AWC's involvement in the Nest Threatened Species Hub. Um, but the content uh, of uh, that you're probably interested in is going to be presented by David and Michael. So we had two main projects within the hub, um, one on feral predator ecology and one on reintroductions to Mount Gibson. So I'll be brief. Um, I just wanted to give a bit of an introduction to who we are and why we're involved in the hub. So we're a private conservation outfit with um, a national remit. We have um, over 6 million hectares that we manage by uh, owning properties or in partnership. 160 staff, um, of which 60 are professional ecologists. So there's quite a significant investment in science. Um, it's one of the reasons we were invited to be a formal partner in the NEST TSR bid. So we were the only non-university uh, formal partner actually in, in, in the hub bid. Um, we're very focused on conservation outcomes. Most of our staff are in the field, currently around $28 million budget, uh, primarily philanthropically funded. So um, given we're all stuck at home, a bit of a tour, some nice properties around the country. And these are the two we're going to be talking about today. So David's work is at Scotia, out in the uh, Mallee in southwest WA, and Michael um, in the northern wheat belt of uh, southwest Western Australia. So in terms of our science program, um, we do a bunch of things. We've got a pr those 60 staff spend most of their time on um, sort of monitoring work, um, inventory work for new sites. We do have a substantial research program as well, um, currently around 25 projects with a whole lot more of people just sort of collaborating or hosting external partners. Now within that, the Nest Hub has, has kindly co-funded two projects. Uh, the total value of that's um, from the Nest funding end is around $100,000 a year. So um, while that's very important to us for a range of reasons, one of which is the participation in the hub, um, I just want to keep that in context. The two projects we're going to present about are predominantly AWC funded. So um, just to give due, due recognition to where the money's actually come from. Um, we do, we've got a nationally leading reintroduction program with 11 sites of which nine are safe havens that don't have cats or foxes. And these sites support 15 nationally threatened mammal species. We'd say that's a pretty good uh, return on investment for what that project uh, costs. Um, the, the program also gives uh, various bits of advice based on our expertise. <clears throat> uh, the research program looks at a range of things. This is my last content slide. Um, so obviously we're interested in threatened species and you know we look at the ecology of various animals in interesting places. We also look to the threats. So we've got this feral predator research program happening at, at a few sites. And the, in red is what NESP is co-funding um, the sort of research themes. So David will talk to that. Uh, as I said, we've got a nationally leading reintroduction program and the NESP work's gone to look at a couple of components of that. Um, we have a broader sort of research agenda around reintroductions that we fund ourselves. And we're also interested in various uh, novel technologies. Just for, uh, again, for scale, um, this is our current matrix of reintroduction, reintroductions going on. That's species across sites. The Mount Gibson one, the one with the light blue heading and the red text, that's the one that Mike's going to be talked about. So again, um, our major reintroduction program right at the moment, in the, certainly in the last uh, five years, um, but part of a bigger program. Okay, that's it from me. I'll try to figure out how to get out of out of that. There we go. <coughs> Hopefully that's done. Yep. Thanks. Yep, that's great. Um, so I think um, was it David who was going to go next? So uh, yeah, this is at Scotia. You can see by the um, central picture, it's mostly Mallee, and that's the fence that protects the um, the animals. Uh, now, why can't I advance this? There we go. So the fence is an obvious uh, component of our strategy, uh, but there's also the outside the fence strategy in terms of reintroducing some of these threatened species 
uh, outside and when you start to think about that option, there's some key questions come to the fore, such as can we reliably uh, estimate predator density for these species that are particularly sensitive to predation? Uh, can we identify thresholds of predator density for which they can persist? Um, uh, are there issues associated with control in terms of controlling one and releasing the other? Which part of the landscapes do they occur? and so on. Um, how better can we target these uh, these predators? And so the predator work at Scotia was essentially looking at the first uh, five of these in, in some degree, and particularly the first and, and, the, and the, um, the fifth. So a lot of effort was put into trying to understand uh, the density of animals outside the fence and whether how that related to the programs that we already had in place, which were just looking at um, sand tracks. So the aims of this were to develop some robust data on fox and cat density outside the fence, to develop, if we could, a methodology for estimating fox density, particularly because they, their pelage is uniform, they don't have marks on them like cats, and some of the methodology relies on individual identification and understanding the relationships between our existing population indices and those density estimates. And then, uh, you know, an emerging information from this was, can we learn more about the ecology of these predators in this landscape and does that help us inform us about control? So this was set up in what we call stage three at Scotia. It's a area right on the South Australian border. Um, this area has had no predator control in it at all. So the, the, the fence is in this northeast corner of the property, that's 8,000 hectares. They had, they, what, there is ongoing predator control in the southern part of the property and then Tarawee, oops, sorry. How do I go back? Arrow. There we go. And uh, Tarawee at the, to the southern boundary of uh, Scotia owned by national, run by National Parks that has control as well, but this area had none. Um, so we set up a grid uh, of camera traps across 14,000 hectares. They were variously a grid, uh, also a transect because transects are used for this type of analysis. Uh, and the grid was either on tracks or off tracks. Um, just to so that we understood uh, how these measures perform in with different setups. So these are the data from four four years of tracking foxes and cats. And so over those four years, we tracked 22 foxes and 14 cats and had about quarter of a million locations from the GPS collars that we put on them. Uh, the collars were getting a location every 20 minutes, so quite data dense. Some basic ecology here, a greater portion of the foxes were range resident than were cats, so about two thirds were, of the foxes were range resident, less than half the cats, and some of the cats were um, quite uh, non-sedentary and displaced up to 100 60 kilometres from Scotia, in the, well in the South Australia and down to the Murray River. And amongst the range resident animals, feral cats had a home range that was about three times larger than that of foxes in the same environment. Uh, you will know that uh, SECA or spatially explicit capture recapture methods using camera traps to es estimate density rely on individual ID. And it's mostly been done for felids of one sort or another, from feral cats to jaguars, because they have individual markings. Um, that doesn't work for foxes or dingoes and other species. So in this instance, we use the GPS collars as the marks on these animals. That has one of the other advantages because it also lets us know uh, which animals we aren't picking up because we know they're on the grid, but we may not have seen them on a camera. And that helps us get more robust estimates. Uh, so from the data, this is the first year of Fox data. Not all individuals were range residents. So uh, the green dots are individuals. I think there's about five there. 
uh, that were range resident and this up here is an animal going into water and we can talk about that later. The ochre colours are non-resident or, uh, or non-sedentary individuals that are moving backwards and forwards uh, across the study area. Often a male, but not only. And so then from the camera traps, we obviously many images. Um, the traps, the cameras were run for 25 days each month uh, for four years. Here we looked at uh, established indices, the Allen index and the Ketling index. They essentially gave the same answer. Um, and so the green is for sand plots and the blue is for camera traps. Uh, the, the indices concurred, if you like, in terms of the value of the index, but the Allen index has the advantage that we can estimate confidence limits around those estimates. So at that point, we didn't consider the Catling Index any further, and we, we were doing our comparisons with the Allen Index. The black line uh, or arrow in the middle here is at the point we introduced uh, lethal control for foxes. So then we went to spatial mark recite methods, and we compared uh, two methods, one using Bayes estimates, uh, which is sort of the gold standard because it takes in, uses the GPS data to improve the estimates and also the more commonly used maximum likelihood estimations. Uh, we looked at the data from each array separately and combined, so comparing on-track, off-track, grids and transects. Um, there were many more detections on track than there were off-track, which is sort of what you expect with animals padding along uh, tracks within the, within the study area. Camera placement had a relatively little effect on the point estimates of density, but the precision uh, or the measure of uncertainty was, was uh, affected quite considerably uh, between the different arrays and grids tended to be much more reliable than, um, than transects. And the, the uncertainty increased quite dramatically as the number of resites of uh, marked animals dropped. And so you can see here the red is the transect data. So the little the three, or oh, sorry, the two. Um, so we've got grids, transects, and combined in that month. Um, generally, the grids had uh, less uncertainty than the transects. And then when you compare the methods, the gold standard up here in red um, often broke down once you didn't have um, uh, a sufficient number of resites. So they concur when you have plenty of uh, resightings of marked animals, uh, but the models didn't converge at all once those numbers dropped and the maximum likelihood methods were more robust across the data set, but the level of uncertainty and the confidence limits really blew out when those numbers of resites dropped away. And stop me if you've got questions. And so then we are uh, comparing an index to density estimates. An index uh, is simple to implement. Um, you can uh, don't have a lot of investment in data analysis and so on. So it can be, it's be made relatively easy operational, but you want to know how that relates to true density. And so here in the purple, we have the Bayes estimates and then the index sort of scaled to match. Um, and then the interest is whether the index goes to zero if the estimates go to zero. And that's a hard thing to do if you're actually lethally killing foxes, which we did at this point here in uh, October of 2017. But, you know, there's, there's reasonable correlation uh, or can be made to line up between the index and the density estimates across a number of points and that looked pretty uh, pretty good. And then once lethal control was interested, you can see it uh, introduced, you can see that the index over time worked away to zero. There's one caveat here is that we also went into a raging drought and so um, many things declined across that period, but nonetheless, the 
but we know that some of those uh, marked animals uh, were killed by the baiting process. Yes, yeah, so once you're, you're into a, um, a situation of lethal control, then your marked animals are being taken out of the system. And so we lost seven of our nine marked animals within a week once the baiting, once we started using um, poison baits. And so as the densities get lower, you either need more cameras or you need more known marks to make this, to enable the system to work if you actually want density estimates as opposed to just an index. And just by way of background, is um, prior to control, we, we were talking about 50 foxes in the in the study area. From what we could work out from space use, and the estimates were telling us about that as well. So, in terms of unmarked methods, there are a couple. Um, in mixture models, there's a you don't need to identify um, uh, individuals. But it has a different set of assumptions. It assumes that your camera traps are independent of each other. And so there is a tendency for it to bias high your, your estimates. And you can see that here. And also it has very wide confidence limits compared to the Allen index that we, uh, that we used. There is another method around P counts and Bayesian uh, inference uh, that's still being worked on with this data by a postgraduate at University of Melbourne. And that work is still going. But it does require a supercomputer to do all the maths. Um, and yeah, we, we haven't seen that outputs yet. So what happened there? So when you compare, um, when we comparing uh, fox indices to cat indices, Lethal control uh, introduced here. Uh, Fox, Fox index was higher than for cats, but they both uh, declined over time uh, towards a very low density. And I've done, I've done some estimates on cat density, and we were down around one animal per hundred square k by the end of the by the end of the period. Uh, yeah, it's, it was interesting that the cats continued to go down at the same time as the foxes, so suggesting that there's a strong environmental effect in this data set. Other things that came from just observation of collared animals, uh, it became quite clear that some of these animals were going out to water sources off property. There's generally, uh, there's no sort of permanent water on Scotia at all. Uh, there are ground tanks on neighbouring pastoral properties that have water in them most of the time. Uh, this animal was a, a female fox that stayed, that maintained this, this home range for consecutive years. And in the summer was going, uh, I think this was about 8K out to this uh, water point and back again. Uh, and they were visiting generally when we had examples of this, uh, the height of summer, uh, animals were going to water every four or five days. Prior to this, there was an idea that foxes got most of their moisture requirements from uh, their prey, and that does get repeated in the literature in Australia. Um, other studies have suggested that they would be in some sort of moisture deficit in hot climes, and this sort of reaffirms that idea. Although not all animals, this was not observed in all animals, but there may have been other sources of uh, water that we did. Other things we see is that for foxes in particular, um, their, their space use was quite stable. So the boundaries and the extent of the home ranges were, were uh, pretty consistent. And they had you know, two, three, four spots within within their range, they used uh, at high frequency. And so you can see here, this is the month across the top. This is the different five different sites down, down the side. And so in December, maintaining three, uh, three sites of high use in January two, but one of them is still the same. And then in uh, February and March, they're down to a single high use site. And this was observed in most 
most uh, individuals and particularly in females. And so the fact that they're stable in their use of um, the landscape and they have particular high use sites means that if you can get your control measures into those areas then you're highly likely to uh, to get them. Uh, when you look at bait uptakes uh, from our control measures, uh, canine pest ejectors were used for three weeks uh, at the start of the control period. We had no takes in those first three weeks. Switched to uh, baits and buried baits with uh, 1080 poison. There's an idea that foxes cache baits uh, and therefore are not necessarily taking the, the poison, not necessarily being poisoned. Well, in our experience, we had seven of nine foxes were killed within seven days and then another after about four weeks. So in terms of the nine animals that we knew to be on in the study area at the time that baiting commenced, um, you know, um, seven eighths of them were dead within a week. So relatively efficient. With cats, um, we had all sorts of trouble with cats in terms of just knowing where they were going because the first some of the collars that we deployed early on, um, because they were dependent on local download, uh, they just disappeared and we weren't quite sure where they'd gone, whether we had a technology failure or not. Um, we just could not find them even when searching by aircraft. Uh, so eventually we were able to get some prototype collars that would uh, transmit via the satellites. And then we discovered why we weren't seeing them. These animals were moving vast distances. And so this is the Murray River down here. And uh, three of them, I think, went as far as the river. This one died. Um, but the black line, this was out towards Burra in South Australia. So it's about 170k from where it was first collared and let go. Um, and then the battery ran out. and. But to our surprise, about 10 months later, that same cat appeared on a camera back at Scotia. So these animals are, are moving across the landscape at very broad scales um, and, uh, yeah, have, uh, they're interacting with particular resources, uh, you know, uh, repetitively, if you like. They're coming back to, to Scotia, which is not quite what I was expecting. The other thing I looked at with this was uh, this question around, you know, if you target cats or foxes, you know, or target foxes, um, is there a response from cats? Um, so I built some dynamic interaction models, so called, for fox, fox, cat, cat, and fox, cat interactions, uh, just to try and understand whether their movements were in, in some way a response to the presence of the other. Foxes generally kept to themselves, even amongst their own kind. Um, and it's the same between foxes and cats, they're essentially moving independently of each other. Uh, but in cats, among the range resident ones, uh, there was quite a lot of interaction. And so this graph just simply shows the distance separation in metres between two individuals. Uh, and this is the week of the year. So over about a 20 week period here, these, these pair of cats were coming into contact with each other uh, at some point in each week over about 20 odd weeks. Um, and this was with either sex. And so uh, one of these is a, a female cat and uh, had two neighboring. So in summary, um, the Allen Index is suitable as an operational tool in this environment, uh, local control, is likely more effective for foxes than cats because they're more resident. Uh, spatial mark recite methods. Um, yeah, uh, obviously uh, detections matter in this system, and so locating cameras on track on tracks uh, outweighs biases that might be associated with uh, uh, placing them more randomly. Precision drops away very quickly as, my, as the number of resites drops away. And our understanding, can we, can we um, target uh, these predators better? Well, certainly in the case of foxes um, around these water sources, there may be an opportunity to intensify. Uh, 
our experience interactions, there seems to be little evidence for interactions between foxes and cats. And I guess in the, amongst the unanswered questions is an unmarked method for density estimation is something we were working towards. We were wanting to do this because then you could only need to identify two species. It unifies the methods across animals in terms of similar size and mobility. P counts being done with uh, Brendan Wintle and his student in, in University of Melbourne has some prospects here, although it's computationally demanding. Uh, we were working towards this, but the estimates were quite unstable and uh, in time ran out on us and development stopped. It would probably work with animals that are quite range resident and sedentary, uh, less easy to implement with animals that move across the landscape like cats and foxes. And other things that haven't been addressed yet is identification of these thresholds for predator density when considering interactions, uh, reintroductions. And that's it. Okay, thanks so much, David. Um, that was really interesting. Um, Michael, you want to get your presentation up right after David closes it? Right, so uh, I'm going to just uh, spend a little bit of time talking about the Mount Gibson Mammal Restoration Project. Um, so I thought I'd just start off with the basics of why 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 are we doing this? Why are we trying to re-establish fauna at Mount Gibson? Well, I guess there's sort of three key reasons. One is all this well, all but one of the species have a, a you know a significant conservation status attached to them. So part of it's about improving that. Um, we're trying to re-establish parts of the system that have, have um, gone over the last 200 years and by doing so we're essentially we're contributing to changing system processes you know we, we're putting in digging animals and animals that will disperse seeds and you know that kind of thing so you know by our management we're, we're hopefully improving conservation status and also um, affecting the system that that we're um, working with um, so it's a co NEST co-funded project. Um, so some of the things we've been looking at is improving monitoring techniques, um, understanding the outcomes of some of the major reintroduction practices um, on, and how they affect things, uh, that how the habitat is used by species, the consequence of putting, you know, reintroducing species. And there's typically a, a reasonably large genetic component to any reintroduction. So Mount Gibson is in the northern wheat belt just there. Um, I just noticed that figure's got a little wonky bit, but the scale is actually 15 kilometres, uh, and that white section is where the, the safe haven is actually located. So it's about 8,000 hectares. The whole sanctuary is about 130,000 hectares. Uh, and the safe havens obviously had all the cats and foxes and some other introduced animals removed. So these are the 10 species we've been working on. Um, so we've now established banded hair wallabies, shark bay, bandicoots, uh, greater stickness rats, bilbies, uh, numbats, woilies and red tailed fascigale. So we've sort of largely completed those parts of the translocation program other than any future supplementary work. Um, the next two years will be, two or three years, we'll be looking at reintroducing possums and Chortich. Um, Chortich and possums will go outside the safe haven. Um, Chortich solely outside and possums both inside and outside the safe haven. Uh, I won't get into that too much today, but that's sort of the next major thing for us. Uh, and we're still playing around a little bit with shark bay mice and trying to work through, through um, establishing that population. So yeah, basically, we, we, as of 2019, we'd worked through most of the species and now we're just sort of moving forward onto the last few species. Um, so some of the sort of research questions we've been thinking about. Um, so some of it's about improving monitoring techniques and so, as a bit of background, you know, there's often things that, there's often attributes of species, you know, like population size or whatever it is that we want to monitor for whatever reasons that they can be quite difficult to get that information in a reasonably robust manner um, you know and regularly things that work in one place won't work in another place 
So we quite often get told, you know, you just do this and that'll work and you, you run that out in your particular environment and it doesn't work. So then you've got to figure out ways to actually get the information you want. Um, and the reality of that is it typically takes time and effort um, and you have to try different things. So it requires a, quite a level of, you know, adaptive research. Um, and I think that's actually something that's very important for regulators to appreciate because, as I said, you, you're often dealing with, um, you know, um, committees and that kind of thing and people will say you know you just have to do this that's what will work and, and often it doesn't um, and so it does require that sort of level of adaptive approach and that that's often hard to convince regulators of that um, and Woylies as a case in hand um, they're very easy to trap so cage trapping is fine but one of the problems with them is that they're actually too trap happy so you put any cages out and it'll get filled up with Woylies that leads to trap saturation which can create biases in your estimates, but also importantly, it stops other species from entering the traps, which makes them difficult to monitor. So we've spent quite a bit of time playing around with that. And really the, the solution we came up with was to, to reduce trap saturation as much as we can by having a lot of sites where we monitor um, and having a lot of traps per site um, with the idea that, you know, we have enough traps and enough um, sites that will, will reduce saturation to the point where we can get something meaningful. But that, of course, means it takes a lot of work and a lot of effort. Um, and then we can also, with, with our sort of more modern uh, statistical approaches, we can also start to try and account for some of that bias in the actual modelling approaches. Um, so in the case of the Woylies, we've, we've done very intensive trapping, both in the number of cages per site and the number of sites. <clears throat> we've employed um, the, the sort of SECRA approach, um, which also it allows you to really properly represent the levels of uncertainty that you have. Um, and we can now, as an example of the Woylies, we can now monitor them annually and we can get results we've got confidence in. Um, and importantly, the one thing I think with a lot of this kind of stuff is you've got to make sure that whatever you're producing, that the people on the ground actually look at and go, yeah, well, that makes sense. If, if you're producing results and people look, who are actually doing all the work on the ground look at it and go, well, that just doesn't make sense and there's probably actually a problem. Um, and importantly, in, in a case of a translocation program where we're putting a lot of species in, this has allowed us to monitor other species more effectively. So it has a sort of evaluating approach of benefit to it. Um, there's other sort of aspects that we've been looking at. Um, for most translocations, animals will typically come from different locations. And often that'll be a mix of wild and, and zoo bred animals. Um, and we often try to not only release enough animals to overcome any sort of stochastic influences on survival, but it, there's also a general desire to sort of maximise genetic diversity to some level and re reduce inbreeding. Uh, and so that that does have some assumptions attached to it. Um, you know, in, in the case of um, you know, trying to maximise genetic diversity, for example, you are actually assuming that enough individuals will survive and, and interbreed to, to, to achieve that, um, and that, that's not necessarily well tested. Um, so in the case of Mount Gibson, as a first step um, <clears throat> in the numbats, we were releasing a mix of zoo bred animals and wild bred, of wild caught animals, and we really wanted to actually just look at some basic questions like, do they survive similarly? And um, were, they, were there any noticeable differences in their behaviour? Uh, you know, and there's been a little bit of work on that in, in general in the past with some mixed results. Um, we ended up with a pretty good solid data set with a reasonable number of animals. Um, and we found they, they had both had very high survivorship. So that didn't really make too much difference, which is, which is great because it means that you, you've got that capacity then to breed zoo animals and have the confidence that, you know, if you take care of some of the key threatening processes that they will actually persist. Um, we also we found some differences in their behaviour. Uh, the, the zoo animals tended to use tree hollows more. We looked at different refuge sites that they used, um, particularly they, they tend to use either hollows in the ground, hollows in trees or burrows. Um, and so they did make some, some different use in those particular refuges, especially during nocturnal periods and diurnal periods. Um, they, they were pretty similar. So, but the, the take home message is that they all survived well um, and they, they were pretty similar in their behaviours, regardless of whether they're wild or zoo bred. Obviously, that might not be the same for different species and different places, but uh, certainly it was for us. <clears throat> uh, so, as I said, there, there is some assumptions associated with this idea of chucking in animals from different places 
that you know you will actually capture the sort of genetic information that you hope to. And one of the one of the things about that is that, as I sort of mentioned before, that uh, animals from different places have similar levels of uh, survival. And so we tested that with Woylies. Um, this is stuff we're still working on at the moment. Um, we've, we've got, for the Woylies, we've got individuals from uh, down south in Western Australia in a place called Para. We've got some individuals from one of our sanctuaries, Karakamai, which is peri-urban around Perth, and, and Whiteman Park, which is similar. Uh, so we released all these animals into the safe haven, and over the next four or five years, we've monitored their survival and, and that kind of thing. And we've basically found that animals that came from Karakamaya tended to have, you know, noticeably higher survivorship than animals from other populations, um, that source populations. So, you know, anim all things aren't equal and taking animals from different places, you, you are going to get potentially different levels of survival. So we're now looking at, you know, does that actually then translate into the, sort of the genetic makeup of the population? So we're now working with Carolyn Hogg's group in Sydney to really look at the sort of genetic contribution of the founders to the, the at this point the F1 generation but we'll potentially do that further to further generations as we go um, so I guess another area that we've sort of started to look at this year is um, that there's a there's a lot of things you have to do to run a translocation and there's a, there's a lot of there's a significant bureaucratic sort of process leading up to it and at times we, we do find ourselves thinking, you know, why are we doing this? This, this, this is probably a reasonably nonsensical kind of thing to be doing, but it takes up a lot of time and a lot of effort. Um, and, and so we started to think about that a bit. And one of the things we had to do for Mount Gibson was to conduct quite detailed habitat quality assessments for the 10 species we were looking at introducing. Um, and that was a, a process that was required. And so we thought, well, we can actually now that we've gone down the road a bit, actually have a look at how that that assessment performed in terms of, um, you know, the, the translocations. Um, and so we, we've just studied five species in particular over the last three or four years, looking at, um, you know, how their changes in occupancy, um, their, their persistence at sites and and the, um, how that related to the habitat quality assessments that we, we did. The assessments were basically uh, done by a team of botanists um, you know, they looked at vegetation types and landforms across the, the, the area where they thought the safe haven was going to go. Um, they looked at a key, they found a series of key attributes, you know, from the literature and that kind of thing for the various species. And they used satellite images and field observations and aerial photography and that kind of thing to create a series of map units um, based on some key attributes. And then they used these, this information to sort of preemptively classify what we thought would be the best moderate and worst habitat uh, within that general area. And so we, we made the basic prediction that if our habitat quality assessments were informative, um, we would expect that individual species as they bred, survived, dispersed, increased in population size, would colonise and persist in the higher quality habitats more preferentially than the lower. Um, and we can test that, which we did. We ran a series of sort of occupancy modelling approaches. I'll just show the results of all the sort of quick results of a couple of those, but in the case of the bilbies, you know, you can see in 2018, we had a few detections and then that increased over 2019 and then in 2020 again. Uh, same for the Woylies, although the Woylies was much more rapid. Um, so we, we then ran a series of modelling and looked at that and we just found no evidence that um, there was any sort of relationship between our estimates of habitat quality and how these species, you know, increasingly occupied the, the safe haven. Um, really, the only thing that mattered the most, it, it really was, um, there was definitely a relationship between turnover rate and the time since they were reintroduced. So, you know, as species were in the safe haven for longer, they um, became more stable in terms of their, their population demographics. So, I guess just to wrap that up then, um, some of the sort of higher level lessons, I guess, we've, we've learned. Um, we feel that we, you know, there, there's a need to improve the reintroduction process. It is often quite bureaucratic, quite susceptible to poor governance, um, and often there's a lot of personal opinion that over, you know, has a significant input into the, the process, and often it's just not right, to be honest. Um, 
And, you know, I think that sort of stuff really needs to be improved and, and there's a long way, to, there's a lot of potential to do that. Um, you know, translocations, they need to be plausible and justified. I think really at the, at the early stage is doing a proper and thorough risk assessment to really understand what the key threats are and uncertainties around that. And that also leads to areas for research. Um, and then following that, then develop the plans that, that address what are thought to be the key management issues, um, not just picking a bunch of management issues that people think are important and then, you know, kind of forcing um, the, the practitioners to deal with those issues. Um, and, you know, really, once organisations start to have a, a pretty strong track record in this area, I think it, it should become an easier process, but it actually becomes, it's becoming harder as in our experience. Um, so that's really all I had to say. Um, and there's a bunch of people who have been involved in this over the last few years, or organisations. Thank you.